I was doing the program this last week, and I came across this little section of Matthew 12 that got me to thinking about an old topic that troubles a lot of people. What has happened in this situation is that Jesus already has been healing people. His reputation is spread all over the Middle East, as it were. I mean, everybody knows who Jesus is, it seems. Uh, people crowd around him. He's healing people of their sicknesses. There are blind people here standing in the group that last week couldn't see. There are people who last week couldn't walk, who are wandering around and talking to people. There are all sorts of people that Jesus has healed. And, every, and he's also, in this particular occasion, for some reason, this seems to be an occasion where a lot of demons are being cast out of troubled people who are possessed by them, have been troubled with them for many years oftentimes. And Jesus was not performing exorcisms. He was commanding the demon to leave, and the demon was going. And whatever was happening was happening in such a manner that the people couldn't gainsay it. Now, it was really pretty hard. You could see with your eyes and hear with your ears and could know that something supernatural is happening. It may be because you knew that person for many, many years and were fully aware of the fact that they were very troubled by demonic forces. And now you see this person that you have known for many years who is as sound-minded as anyone you've ever known. So you know the change has taken place. Now what is fascinating about this is that as these things take place, there are a number of people in the crowd standing around who say, well, he's casting out demons by the power of Baal's above the prince of demons. Now Jesus knew that, and he called them up short. One of the first things he did was say, well, you've got to be kidding. If, if Satan is casting out demons, his house is divided. His house can't stand. And he gave them the logic, the stupidity of what they were saying, <coughs> it was, it was, is the first thing that he established in talking to these men. But he went beyond that. You have to think for a moment, what kind of a mind can watch a person do a miracle, can actually see the miracle take place right in front of his eyes, and say, well, that's not of God. That's of the devil. What kind of a mindset would do that? Now, this is kind of a, is a problematic thing, but Jesus, having listened to them, knowing what was in their heart and mind, said this, Wherefore I say unto you, this is in Matthew 12 and verse 31, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven unto men. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So what Jesus establishes here is that there is such a thing as an unpardonable sin. And the very mention of the word, sometimes I'm almost hesitant to, to talk about this subject, because it gives people some sleepless nights oftentimes afterward, because all of us are sinners, all of us have made mistakes, all of us have sinned when we knew better, and that old question of, well, will God forgive me for this, can really be difficult. I think there is a presumption, oftentimes, though, that goes along with the unpardonable sin, that it must be a really great sin. It must be a really big thing, this unpardonable sin. And, of course, the traditional view that many of us have taken in times past, when we look at this particular occasion, is that the attribution of the works of the Holy Spirit to the devil is actually, according to Jesus, the unpardonable sin. Although, Jesus here really seems more to be cautioning them against this thing rather than saying, you have already done it. He just simply says that you blaspheme the Holy Spirit and this cannot be forgiven. But the question is, why not? Because he seems to say that you can say anything you want to against him, personally, the Son of Man. But if you say something against the Holy Spirit, that can't be forgiven. And that raises all kinds of questions. One question it raises is, uh, then you mean there is a real distinction between Jesus and the Holy Spirit? It seems to me that this particular passage of Scripture would be problematic for people who hold a Trinitarian view, if you see what I mean. For how can you speak evil against Christ and it be forgiven? Speak evil against the Holy Spirit, it cannot. If they really are two persons in the same Godhead, how can you make that distinction between the two of them? But that's, again, another question. But 
what would there be, what kind of blasphemy would there be against the Holy Spirit that makes it worse than anything else? And this is really one of the questions that's involved. And I really think that we have kind of grabbed hold of the wrong end of this question when we speak of the unpardonable sin. Because the presumption is that it is one particular sin over here that can't be forgiven, and every other, all the other garden variety sins, what have you, big sins, small sins, can be forgiven. I'd like to explore it with you just a little bit today, and maybe advance your understanding of this rather vexed subject. In Hebrews, the fifth chapter, actually the, question, the scripture in question is in the sixth chapter, but I think it's a good idea to lead up to this, uh, this passage so that you understand more, more specifically what it's all about. In Hebrews chapter 5, and I'll begin in verse 1. Every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin, who can have compassion on the ignorant and them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed about with infirmity. You know, in the Old Testament, there were, there were two broad categories of sin that were talked about back there. One of them was a, a uh, what, what the... the the book of Leviticus calls a sin of ignorance. The other one is a presumptuous sin, which is described in more detail in Numbers, the 15th chapter. Now, I'm not going to go back to Numbers, the 15th chapter. I just want to talk to you, generally speaking, about what's there. In Numbers, the 15th chapter, it makes a specification. It says, if a man commit a sin in ignorance, then he shall go to the priest, he shall do this, he gives the offering and the ceremony and so forth. Then it says, but if a man commit a sin presumptuously, that man shall die. There's no question of going up to, the, up to the temple. There's no question of making offerings. There's no question of getting this thing forgiven and wiped over. You're dead. Now, what's really fascinating is that immediately following this is one of those passages of scriptures that, that people who observe Sunday like to vex Sabbath keepers with. It's the man who went out gathering sticks on the Sabbath day and got stoned for it. Remember the example? Now, what is often overlooked is People, this particular passage of Scripture is not in a historical section. It's not running down a history. This happened today, this happened the next day, and on the third day this guy went out and gathered sticks on the Sabbath, right? It's not in that kind of section. It is immediately following in the Numbers, the 15th chapter, the passage that tells you what you have to do with presumptuous sins. What this tells me is that this particular individual was committing an in-your-face kind of sin, a high-handed sin. It's the kind of sin that says, I don't care what you say. I don't care about your rules. You know, get lost in your face. And he went out there and gathered sticks on the Sabbath day. Consequently, there was no forgiveness. He was taken out and he was stoned. Now, if that same man had had a wife and a kid, and there had been an unexpected cold snap come through, and the amount of firewood he had to keep his family warm was not sufficient to get him over the Sabbath day. And he went out and gathered sticks on the Sabbath day, contrary to the law, and brought them back in and got arrested for it and brought before the judge. Do you think that the judgment would have been the same? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think he would have had mercy shown to him by the judge because of the circumstances that surround his sin and because he would come in and say, I'm sorry, I really didn't mean to cause offense to anybody. I didn't. It wasn't that I wanted to break the Sabbath day. I respect the Sabbath. I love the Sabbath. But my wife is cold. My baby is cold. And, and I need some warmth in the place you know, for their sakes. I think the judge would have said, well, a lot of us who were kind of cold last night, uh, just try not to do it again. A lot of people who are of a legalistic bent think that the Old Testament law was administered by a computer. You know, and if this particular set of digits is out of line, it comes back and give you this fatal error message. You're dead. It's over. It didn't work that way. You were caught up, you were brought in, you were judged, and you were dealt with according to what you had done, according to the circumstances, according to your attitude, according to your repentance, and all these kind, kind, kinds of things. So you didn't have this, this legalistic thing that existed in Jesus' day that he kept running up against in the tribes and Pharisees all the time. So keep that in mind when you think about, about what's, what's going on here. So he said he can have compassion on the ignorant and them that are out of the way. Two categories of people. Those who are ignorant and those who are out of the way. People who don't understand. Or, and I think, I think this can, by, be, can be extended to people who sin through weakness. Now, not with a high hand. Not because of a mean spirit. Because they just lack the physical strength or because the circumstances call for it. Or because they're afraid. 
He said, no man takes this, uh, this honor to himself that Jesus has, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest. But he that said to him, You are my son, today have I begotten you, said to him another place, You are a priest after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears to him that was able to save him from death, he was heard in that he feared. And though he were a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all those that obey him. In other words, Jesus through, went, went through this thing that he might be the author of eternal salvation. He is called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, he said, I've told you all this, and I have many things to say about this. They're hard, though, to be uttered, seeing that you folks are so dull of hearing. You ought to be teachers by now. But you've got need that one teach you all over again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. Everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He is a babe. Strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Then in chapter 6 he says this, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Now, he doesn't mean abandoning them. He means don't just sit on the principles. You've got to go forward. You've got to grow and develop. Let's go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith toward God, the doctrine of baptism, the doctrine of, of, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. We'll do all this if God will permit. We won't abandon those things. We will build on this foundation. For, and this is where the joker comes into the deck or where the, where the crunch comes in. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away, it is impossible to renew them to repentance. Now that is kind of spooky. And right here, right on this little pivot point, focuses a great debate among Protestants. For there are those who believe in a doctrine of this, what they call the security of the believer, which means once saved, always saved. That if you have been saved, it's not possible for you to fall away. Then there's another group of them who believe that it certainly is possible to fall away. If it's not possible to fall away, why do we have this particular passage of Scripture that says you can fall away? Now, the question, though, that comes to me, and I think might come to your mind on some dark night whenever you're thinking too much about your past and some of the things you might have done, is, now, wait a minute. I knew better. I had tasted the powers of the, good work, of the world to come. I actually did understand these things. I have received the Holy Spirit. I've tasted the heavenly gift. And I, I, I understand the powers of the world to come. And I have sinned. What about me? Well, the passage, fortunately for us, does not end here. He goes on to say what it is that we have done. We have crucified the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. Now, does that mean that, that by the mere act of getting yourself trapped in a circumstance and telling a lie to get yourself out of it, that you have crucified the Son of God all over again? For if that's true, then there is no hope for any of us here. Because whether it is that you were trapped in a circumstance and lied your way out of it, or whether it is that you got weak one time and stole, or whether you and your boyfriend got the windshield all heated up in the car and got in the back seat and did things you shouldn't do, uh, whatever it is, whatever it is, all of us here have sinned when we knew better. We have sinned since our conversion. We have sinned since our baptism. And it isn't that we didn't know any better. We knew better. We were afraid. We were weak. We were ignorant. And whatever, it is, whatever your excuse is, I know what mine are. But we all had excuses, right? Now, if you're going to take the hard line on this, there are no Christians. We're all dead. Because no one will be able to avoid sinning and to say that, well, but you sinned when you knew better. <laughs> How many sins in your life did you not really know any better? Now, you may not have understood the consequences of what you were doing. But surely you knew that what you were doing was wrong. Well, let's continue. He said, They have crucified the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. But the earth, for the earth which drinks in the rain that comes often upon it and brings forth 
herbs fit for them by whom it is dressed, receives blessing from God. But that which bears thorns and briars is near unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we speak this way. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And here we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope to the end, that you don't be slothful. You stir yourself up. You get to work. Do these things. Now, there's a great deal more in the context that I could go to, but I want to take you to chapter 10, because it's in chapter 10 that I think some of these things become even clearer than, than otherwise they might have been. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11, Every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those whom he has set apart. The word sanctified is a, one of those religious words that confuses things, I think, from time to time. What it really means is that we have been elected by God, we have been, been selected, we have been taken and set apart for him. The Holy Spirit, then, is a witness for, to us. For after he said before, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Now, I want to tell you something. The instant that the Spirit of God writes the law of God into your inward parts, He creates a terrible conflict. Instantly. For before the Holy Spirit comes and writes the law into your heart and your mind, there's no conflict there. You're living your life. You do what you want to do. You may be afraid of consequences. You may be afraid of the Internal Revenue Service. You may be afraid of all kinds of that kind of stuff. But that's it. Once the law of God is written in your heart and your mind, now you know that God has some standards out there and that he really does expect you to live up to those standards. And the carnal mind doesn't want that. For the law of God says, don't do that. And the carnal mind says, I don't want anybody telling me what I can't do. I don't want anybody telling me what I have to do or what I can't do. And so the conflict between the Spirit of God and the, uh, and the carnal mind is instantaneous. He says also, their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Your sin's gone, it's gone, it's over. We don't have to worry ourselves anymore about that. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, having a high priest over the house of God, let's draw near with a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Our conscience sprinkled, basically cleansed. You know, it's that conscience inside of us that's the troublemaker. It's the conscience that sits down there at night when you're trying to sleep and says, you know what you did, don't you? And you say, and you, all you can say, answer your conscience and say, yeah, I do know what I did. I, I wish I hadn't done it. And then to sit there and try to rewrite all the reasons why you did it and make it look better than it did, that conscience can be really troubling. And yet, what Paul says is that when we go down in the waters of baptism and we come back up, we have been sprinkled, as it were, from an evil conscience. It's like the sprinkling of the blood on the altar purifies it. It's all gone. Well, then what are we, how is this supposed to go away? How do we get rid of that stuff? He goes on to say, Our bodies washed with pure water as in a baptism. Let's hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful to promise, which means you have made a profession of faith. Now hang on to it. And let's consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling ourselves of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. The fact is that in order to, to get ourselves free from the world, in order to get ourselves in a right frame of mind, in order to bring ourselves closer to God, the exhortation of others is needful. We need to be together. We need to be in church. We need to be provoking one another, like sticking each other with a prod to love and to good works and reminding one another of what we're supposed to do. I don't know about you folks. I need positive reinforcement. I need people who look at me and expect me to do better. I need the awareness that if I do fall short, I'm going to disappoint some people. It's good for me, for I know that God sees me, and I know that God's up there, but somehow or other, 
you people are more real. Isn't that strange? Be dishonest to say it otherwise. You people are here. And one other, you know, this is another side of this story. Christ lives in us. Therefore, if by the way I live my life, I cause you to stumble, I have caused one to stumble in whom Christ lives, and I have been an offense unto Christ by the offense that I have made to you. I really do think that it is important for us to be in touch and for us to have people we can ask for prayer, for us to have people who will give us an encouraging word, for people who will tell us, you know, whenever we're saying, well, I wonder if I really ought to do this or not, to tell us, well, I don't really think you should, and I think you probably know you shouldn't, because that little extra reinforcement from a brother or sister sometimes is all you need to keep you on the right side of the line. Just that little amount. I'm surprised often as a minister how often people will ask me counsel about things like this and I will ask them what is it that you think you ought to do? And they know. They have, there's no question. They really do know what they really need though is for me to tell them you're right that's what you need to do. That little extra reinforcement sometimes makes all the difference in the world. It isn't just me. It can come from all of you as well. Now we come to this critical part. He said, you need to exhort one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For. Notice that little word, for. That makes a connection between what came before and what's about to come afterward. The fact of the matter is that we are at risk. And this thing of staying together and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together and provoking one another to love and good works is connected to the prevention of what comes afterward. For if we sin willfully... After we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Now, let me stop right there for a moment, and let's, let's think about this. Does this mean that you sin knowing that what you are doing is wrong? Not, not, that's not what willful is. Willful is headstrong, deliberate, determined. You have knowledge, yes, but more than knowledge, you don't care. Willful is a, you know willful people. You know that kind of stubbornness in, in people. And to some extent, I think many of us may have experienced it as well. But we're going to have to have it defined for us a little further in the context of what he's talking about here. This is the kind of sin that Moses' law was talking about when it talked about the presumptuous, high-handed, in-your-face kind of sin. Not merely having sinned when you knew you should not have done it. Okay? Now, he says, there remains therefore no, no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation that shall devour the adversaries. Notice, this is not guesswork. When a person has willfully sinned and cut himself off from God, we're not sitting around saying, well, wow, I really wonder if God will forgive me of that. I really wonder if I have committed the unpardonable sin. I wonder if I've cut myself off from God. I can ask you one question. Do you want to be cut off from God? Do you want to be cut off from God? Now, if the answer is no, then you haven't committed the unpardonable sin. Yet. Yet. If you still would like to come back to God, if you would want to be forgiven, there's still hope. Let's continue, and I'll show you, before I'm finished, what I mean. This poor guy has got a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation that will devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under the hand of two or three witnesses. You know that word? That didn't just say broke Moses' law. It says despised Moses' law, who looked down his nose at it, considered it as contemptible, and whose sin was deliberate, willful, and, to use the Old Testament word, presumptuous. It's a little different from the weak sinner. He then says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorrow or punishment do you suppose shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God? Now, I think probably, I don't know what your, all of your religious background is, but I think there's a chance that sometime in your religious background you might have thought that for a person who had been baptized, received the Holy Spirit, been a member of God's church, and, and been led along by God to sin, and be aware that he committed the sin when he did so, that that act constitutes treading the Son of God underfoot. But I think you've got to take a broader context than that. 
Because the truth is, what I described in terms of sin is something that I think all of us really have done in one time or another since our baptism. We have sinned when we knew what we were doing was wrong. Now, there may be some exceptions to that. You righteous people out there, if you'd like to take a coffee break, go ahead. The rest of us need to work our way through this particular passage of Scripture. Of how much worse sore punishment do you suppose shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted? Now, to count something is a conscious act, folks. This isn't something you do by accident. You actually count the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Now, that is an interesting expression. The person we're talking about is, is, is an in-your-face sinner. He has trodden underfoot the Son of God and despised the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> he has counted the blood as being of no account. And he has done despite to the spirit of grace. Now, you do understand, don't you, that it is by grace we are saved, through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's not my invention. That's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Okay? Now, if the spirit of grace is that which justifies us before God and saves us, and we do despite to that spirit of grace, and we tread underfoot the, son, the sacrifice of the Son of God and count His blood as being pointless and treat it as with contempt, then where in the world can we possibly expect forgiveness to come from? <coughs> That's what this is talking about here. Now, I'm, what I am telling you here is that a person does not <clears throat> accidentally commit the unpardonable sin. A person does not live a, a, a Christian life and because of a weakness on one occasion do something he shouldn't do, knowing better, and has committed the unpardonable sin. We're going to discuss this, I think, further. We understand this better as we, as we make our way along. But that's not the way a person gets into the condition of having committed the unpardonable sin. We says in verse 30, We know him that has said, Vengeance belongs to me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I would say, you know, from where I stand today, I have absolutely no fear of falling into the hands of God. I stand in awe of God. I fear God. I am not afraid of God. Because I know that what he does, even the chastisement, even the pain, even the suffering, is for my good. And I know where it's all going to go. So who is going to be, for who is it going to be a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God? Remember when David had done a really big foul up in numbering the children of Israel. They asked him what it was that he wanted as his punishment for it. And in the end of it all, after having evaluated, he said, let God punish me. He says, I trust him. He doesn't want to fall in the hands of his enemy. He was far rather to fall into the hands of God. The ordinary man in the street, the ordinary Christian, the ordinary guy, you know, people like you and I, have no reason to fear falling into the hands of the living God. It's the person who doesn't care. It's the person who doesn't care what God says. The person who doesn't care about the sacrifice of Christ. The person who isn't interested, has, doesn't in repenting, doesn't want to repent. Think about that for a moment, folks. There is the kind of person in this world who is not only unrepentant, but doesn't want to repent. And so I could ask anybody, you know, who thinks they have committed the unpardonable sin, well, would you, do you really want to repent? Would you really want to come back to God? Would you want God to, to take you back? And if the answer to that is at all, yes. Or even I hope so. Or even I wish I could. No, you have not gone too far. You have not crossed the line. There is still hope. Now, there's a proverb. Uh, you can turn to it if you'd like. I won't. It's Proverbs 29, verse 1, that says this. It's only one short verse. He that being often reproved. Now, I don't know about you folks, but that's happened to me lots of times. That by one means or another, by some human being coming to me and telling me something that I know is right, that I've done wrong, that's a reproof. And I can consider it, even though it comes from a man, it's a reproof from God. He who being often reproved. I've had my occasions, just like you have, when I've made mistakes and suffered for them and lain awake the night, late at night worrying about the consequences of them. I consider that a reproof. He who, being often reproved, hardens his neck. In other words, there is a, a conscious 
act of hardening and stiffening and refusal on the person who is refusing shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. The fact of the matter is the situation of the of the sinner who has committed the unpardonable sin, who has come to the place to where God will not forgive him any longer, it really isn't that God won't forgive him. It's that he won't repent. He can't repent. He doesn't want to repent. And how in the world, if a person doesn't want to repent, doesn't want to turn their life around, how could he ever possibly do so? It's a, it's a contradiction in terms. It doesn't work, as the old saying goes. Now, I want you to turn back with me to Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, because here is a, a stunning principle. And I, I, I remember the first time I ever came across this and how hard it hit me when, it, when I saw it. It's in Jeremiah, the 18th chapter. Now, this is a, a real fundamental prophetic message here, and I think an important one for everybody to understand. It's one of the things that many prophecy buffs do not understand and have never really tackled properly. In Jeremiah 18, the word of the Lord came to him saying, Go down to the potter's house, and when you get down there, I'm going to cause you to hear my words. So he went down to the potter's house, and he saw the guy working on the wheels. And the vessel the guy was working on was marred in his hand, and he looked at it and said, This is no good. So he just put it down a little ball again and started from the beginning, started all over again. And the word of the Lord said to, to me, came to me saying, O house of Israel, can't I do with you as this potter? Can I not? As, as, the, as the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And right here now comes the, the most fundamental principle of prophecy in the Bible. This is, really the, this is the, the basis of it all. If you don't understand this principle and you're out there studying prophecy, you are probably going to come out totally wrong. Okay? Here it is. At what instant I shall speak concerning a kingdom and a nation to pluck it up, to pull it down, and destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil I thought to do to them. That is the deal. In other words, God comes along and says, I'll tell you what, here's the deal, folks. I'm going to send a prophet from time to time, and that prophet's going to come, he's going to say, you people have sinned. You know, you've done all these things that are wrong, and lay them out before you, and I am going to destroy you, thus saith the Lord God. Now, if you think for a moment, you probably can come up with a classic illustration of this. Jonah walked into the cities of Nineveh, and he says, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. I don't know if you ever noticed this in reading Jonah. He does not say, If you don't repent, you will be overthrown. This is an ironclad, rock-solid prophecy from Almighty God. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. But wait. Here is this, this fundamental principle of the conditional nature of prophecy. If a nation against whom I have pronounced this repent and turn around I will repent of the evil that I was going to do to them. That's a fair deal. You know, the prophet comes along and says, you're in a lot of trouble. And you clothe yourself with sackcloth, you humble yourself before God, you pray, and God says, well, look at there. Look at there. This guy has turned his life around. To me, I think one of the great, you know, great illustrations in the Bible about this particular item, I don't have it in my notes, so I can't take you to it today, but I can tell you, is a man named Ahab. The prophet tells us that there was no one in all the kings of Israel who sold himself to do evil like Ahab. He was the worst of the worst. Well, God sent Elijah down to him. Elijah gives him the prophecy. And all these terrible things, he says, are going to happen to Ahab. Lists them all off for him. And Ahab heard him. And it tells us that Ahab, Ahab fasted. He clothed himself in sackcloth. And he says, who knows, maybe God will repent of this and won't do it to me. And God said to his prophet, he said, look what Ahab has done. See how he has turned himself around? I will not bring this evil on his house in his, his, his days because he has done this. Remind you, there was no king in all the history of Israel as bad as they were that had done as bad as this man. How bad do you got to be, folks, before it is too late to repent and turn around? The man was a murderer, a killer. He was an idolater. He, he, was, he, was, he was rotten to the core. But he could be frightened by God. And when he was, clothed himself in sackcloth and went softly. God says, I won't do it in his day. I'll wait and I'll do it in his son's day because the prophecy had also included his sons. And I'm often fond of asking the question to people who hear that. And I say, now what do you think would have happened if Ahab's sons 
knowing that prophecy, had done what their father did, done what old daddy did. You know, let's clothe ourselves in sackcloth. Let's humble ourselves before God and let's pray. God would have said, well, look what Ahab's sons have done. I'm not going to bring it in their day. And the implication of some of the things we read in the Bible are that to the second and third or fourth generation, that curse would pass away from his household forever if those second and third and fourth generations could just get their act together. How bad you got to be before God will not forgive you. But you see, this is where we've made our mistake. It's not a question of how bad you are or how bad you have been or how bad you have got to be before we start talking unpardonable sin. Listen to how he goes on with this particular thought. He says, At what instant I shall speak, verse 9, concerning a kingdom and a nation to build and to plant it. This is Jeremiah 18, verse 9. And if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good which I said I would benefit them. Aha! So the deal has two sides. If we're doing fine, God pronounces a blessing upon us, and then we turn around and do evil, you're not going to get that blessing. It'll pass away. That's fair, isn't it? That's fair. It all depends on what we're doing. And the thing that I, I, I've tried to impress upon people about prophetic studies is prophecy is given to us not to foretell the future, but so we can change the future. If we can change our conduct and of the people around us, we can actually change the outcome of a lot of these things. And people don't understand that. It would say, well, but wait a minute, the Bible says it has to happen this way. Well, it said Nineveh had to be destroyed in 40 days too, didn't it? Was it? No. The fact of the matter is, prophecy, generally speaking, is conditional. The reason why it generally works out exactly like they said is because we don't change. It's because we don't respond, won't listen. We just keep on plugging right on the way that we have been going. Now, therefore, he says, go to. I want you to tell this to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say, Thus saith the Lord. I frame evil against you. I devise a device against you. Return now everyone from his evil ways and make your ways and your doings good. What was their response to that prophecy? They said, no, there's no hope. We're just going to go ahead and walk after our own devices and do the imagination of our evil heart. No, uh -uh. Uh, there's no hope. And, you know, this is one of the things that, I, I, that frightens me the most about people that I counsel with and I deal with. I have on several occasions in the course of my ministry tried to counsel with people who believe that they had committed the unpardonable sin and tried to show them the things I'm showing you here today. And what really has always puzzled me about them is they seem to want to believe that there is no hope. Now, can you figure out why a person would be in that frame of mind? I, I encountered in one case, I finally I learned on one of the situations I've dealt with in all my ministry, only one time have I found out what was really going on and what was really at stake. And that was, was a woman, a woman I cared a lot about. She was a very nice lady, who because of the old uh, the divorce and remarriage uh, teachings of her church at that time, felt like she had to live single the rest of her life, and she was deeply and profoundly in love with the man that she wanted to marry. And she felt... Well, if I've committed the unpardonable sin, there's no hope part and point in me trying any longer with God. There's no reason for me not to go ahead and marry this guy. And I look back on it and I think how, how, how sad and how heartbreaking that story is. Because here was a woman who was really, almost, was really ready to give up God for this man, which is a real tragedy in and of itself. But there was something down inside of her that would not let her do it. She kept coming to me wanting me to tell her that there was no hope and I never would I never would I don't know how that finally came out downstream in her life I never would tell her that there was no hope because the very fact that she was coming to me and struggling with it meant that there was that God's spirit was still in her God was still working with her God was still drawing her and all of the complicated issues of her personal life notwithstanding didn't matter but the thing that the scripture brings home to me is that it's really not so much a matter of there being a sin that God will not forgive the problem is that there is a sin of which we will not repent and that sin is unpardonable it's not God's fault that it's unpardonable it's because you and I won't let go of it it's because we're not willing to 
to, to, you know, to go to step up to the plate or to bite the bullet, to use whatever cliche you'd prefer in that situation, and deal with the problem. And so God hasn't cut us off, but we have lost blessings for ourselves. We have hurt our relationship with God. We have messed up our lives and the lives of other people and spiritual relationships along the way in trying to deal with some of these things that we deal with. But we have not gone beyond the realm of hope as long as the Holy Spirit is still talking to your conscience. As long as you're still worried about it. As long as you still want God. The problem comes when you lose the want to. That's the problem. And when you have lost the want to repent, then it's not possible for you to repent. And if it's not possible for you to repent, it's not possible for you to be forgiven. So it isn't that there is an unpardonable sin out there somehow that we have to work our way around or hopefully find our way back to God with. That's not the point. The point is that we ourselves come to the place to where we're not willing to work our way back. Now, if you return to Matthew 12 again, that situation where these people you know, were saying these things about Jesus, these were religious people. These were believers in God. Uh, they were people, though, who were a part of the religious establishment to whom Jesus posed a threat because he's new wine and old bottles, folks. And I mean, it isn't the old way of your religion isn't going to work with me any longer. But they didn't want what Jesus was bringing. The problem was, how do you deny it? How do you avoid it? How do you not face up to this? The only way they could find, because they had to acknowledge the supernatural nature of what Jesus was doing, was to attribute the work of God to the devil. The alternative was to admit that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, to admit that a representative of the kingdom of God had come to them who was powerful, more powerful than the forces of darkness, and that everything they were living for and doing had to be cast aside and become like dung to them. And they couldn't do it. They could not bring themselves to do it. So I think when we come across this little passage of Scripture in Matthew, like I did in my program last week, we need to realize that there is no sin too great for God to forgive. There is no, no insult toward God that he becomes offended and won't listen to us anymore. The problem is not inside of God, it's inside of us. We have got to listen to the voice of God, listen to the Spirit of God, turn toward him. And I will tell you, with complete confidence before God, as long as you want to, there is hope. There is no sin too great.